to all my queers and dears, and welcome to the December 2023 monthly video essay. This month, we're going to be digging into one of my many somewhat controversial opinions on stories that I love, because I kind of have a lot of those, and I'll definitely be making those arguments in my video essays now and then to hopefully provide some new angles through which to look at widely accepted sentiments. This time, we're going to be discussing Chris Chibnall's controversial tenure as the showrunner of Doctor Who, and examine the missed potential of the stories that he told. Before we begin, it's important to note that the news arm of the BBC has a continuing issue with transphobic leanings in its news coverage. While this is not the fault of any members of the Doctor Who team, Doctor Who is a product of the BBC, and it is important to highlight this issue until it has been meaningfully addressed. I'd also like to quickly say that while I personally am not a huge fan of Chibnall's work as showrunner, I know there are people who love it, and I'm not here to invalidate you if you're one of them. I'd also request that the members of my audience who have issues with the 13th Doctor era to offer those people the same courtesy. I've always said objective quality is a myth, and I'm sure you'll hear me say that many more times on this channel. No matter how much you hate something, someone else will love it, and vice versa. And no one is wrong or stupid for being emotionally impacted by something you found poorly executed. Without further ado, let's dig in. Adam Myers presents The Tragic Missed Potential of the Thirteenth Doctor. Edited by Remnant Bardock and Adam Myers. Let's get this out of the way. Chris Chibnall's time as showrunner of Doctor Who, and especially the twist of The Timeless Child, are loaded topics. I'm not here to convince any of you to love it or to hate it, simply to offer a perspective on it that you may not have considered. My belief is that for all the backlash it's received, the direction Chris Chibnall took the show is not inherently bad, and could have been used for some really interesting stories. Doctor Who is a show that is constantly changing and reinventing itself, and I personally believe Chibnall's work does give future writers a lot that they can do with the character of the Doctor. But that's the rub, isn't it? In my opinion, Chibnall didn't really take advantage of the ideas he introduced. Russell T. Davies has expressed support for The Timeless Child, and confirmed he won't be retconning any of Chibnall's tenure as showrunner. We've already seen acknowledgement and even some building on the events of the 13th Doctor's era by RTD, so that's why it's worthwhile to look back and evaluate the missed potential, so that when RTD or any future showrunner touch on it, we can look at their decision to do so as recognizing that potential. There's absolutely positive mileage that can be derived from this, and I don't want to discredit the possibility of other writers using this twist or any of the other developments of the Chipnell era for a better story. But, I'm not going to tell you that Chibnall should not have been responsible for telling those stories in the first place. So, accepting that Chibnall was always dedicated to the Timeless Child and Division story arcs, let's talk about what made some of the directions he took the show so frustrating for some members of the audience, and then play with some hypotheticals that may have made them more fulfilling. Let's talk about the so-called FAM, as once Graham and Ryan left, many who criticized the FAM felt the companion dynamic became stronger with Yaz and even Dan, myself included. Companions have vital roles in Doctor Who. They ask questions, and they challenge the Doctor. During Chibnall's first two seasons, aka Series 11 and Series 12, the so-called FAM didn't often fulfill either of these roles with 13 often asking and answering questions herself, which could honestly be exhausting at times, while the fam often acted as almost assistants that follow her lead, rather than their own well-defined people. This is particularly unfortunate, as the fam's introduction and even some episodes that they featured in absolutely had interesting setups and developments for their stories that didn't feel properly utilized. Credit where it's due, 
In some rewatches I did for this essay, there was more to them than I remembered, but I think it's still worthwhile to discuss this. Yaz is a police officer frustrated with her job, and her training could have come into play any number of times. Though Yaz's ambition for more out of life is one of the more consistent characteristics of a 13th Doctor companion. We do get to see why she is implied to have become a police officer in the episode Can You Hear Me? where we discover that Yaz at one point was going to run away from home due to many struggles, particularly at school with lots of bullying. An officer is called in to help her and guides her through her crisis, reminding her that this is just one moment in a lifetime of moments, and playfully offering a monetary bet that things won't stay that way forever, which motivates Yaz to give things a bit of time and try moving forward. This certainly makes sense as the reason Yaz decides to join the police, as well as potentially her frustration with being limited to assignments like resolving petty squabbles over parking spaces that somehow escalated beyond what was reasonable. Perhaps Yaz's behavior in her time as a companion could have been more focused on how that moment influenced her. Perhaps she could have been more tuned in to the personal conflicts and crises of others, perhaps having a real focus on supporting them. That could have been particularly interesting with Thirteen having such a difficult time being vulnerable and addressing her feelings. Something I'll talk about more in the next section when we talk about the mispotential of the Thirteenth Doctor herself. But Yaz is deeply emotionally affected by the Doctor keeping her companions at arm's length, highlighted in particular during Series 13, aka Doctor Who Flux, and it would have been meaningful for Yaz to be more proactive in trying to push the Doctor to open up in Series 11 and 12 as well particularly Series 12. The Doctor does not want to think about her struggles, and Yaz is the perfect character to challenge that impulse. Ryan and Graham aren't really as suited to challenging the Doctor on this particular issue, and Yaz paying extra attention to Thirteen's emotional state would have given us both a clear, unique trait for Yaz, and given us a bit more time and depth exploring the impacts of the major events that occur, such as after Spyfall Part 2, when the Doctor has returned to Gallifrey and seen it once again in ruins thanks to the actions of the Master. Moving on to Graham, he is a cancer survivor and a bus driver who has had his wife fridged by the writers, and even states at Grace's funeral that he felt he should have died instead. I do think that Graham's relationship with Grace is probably one of the more fleshed out parts of the fam with her appreciation for life being what drew him to her and what he seems to take with him from her death. Rather than seeing him struggling with a strangely out-of-character desire for revenge against Simshaw, the member of the Stenza race whose actions led to the death of Grace, it would have been interesting to see Graham struggle with being pulled between his cautionary nature and a feeling of obligation to the ghost of Grace to live life to the fullest and to take care of her grandson Ryan, since his willingness to go on adventures and his dedication to Ryan are both implied to be fueled by him asking himself what Grace would have said to him in any given moment. That said, early on his dedication to Ryan often fails to include an understanding that despite the importance to him that Ryan accepts him as his granddad, Ryan may have valid reasons to be reluctant to. More on that soon. Can You Hear Me digs further into his sense that he is living on borrowed time when he realizes he has a deep fear that his cancer will inevitably come back someday. There ought to have been a push and pull between his desire to be more like his late wife and his own nature as, frankly, a relatively average if somewhat worry-prone person who cares deeply about his family. In my opinion, Graham ought to have been one of the loudest critics of the Doctor because of the danger Ryan was often put in. He could easily have had a similar arc to Rory Williams in the Moffat era, but, you know, with less Romans. In other words, he could have been much more critical of the way the Doctor makes people dangerous to themselves, even as they also have a positive influence on them, but slowly acclimating to the lifestyle and enjoying it alongside his family, while recognizing the problems that arise with that lifestyle. You told her to leave us a sign. She did. I swore to protect you. I promised. Rory. This is your fault. I'm so sorry, but Rory... No, this is your fault! 
You, you, should, you should look at a history book once in a while, see if there's an outbreak of plague or not. That is not how I trap. Then I do not want to travel with you! Instead, his cautionary nature comes off as almost an aesthetic, present for comedy rather than character. The fact that by the end of series 11, he's about to make the humans that have been converted into Cyberman aware of the horrors of their existence, and he seemingly has no worries or objections, feels extremely contrary to how someone with the background and worldview of a man like Graham O'Brien would react. And then there's Ryan, a warehouse worker and mechanic in training who lives with dyspraxia. His mechanic training ought to have been extremely useful to a variety of situations, and would have been interesting to explore with a doctor that's depicted very much as a tinkerer in a way that not all of them are, with perhaps him wanting to learn from her. For example, when 13 built her own sonic screwdriver, it would have been really cool to see him get involved. Obviously, he's not going to fully understand the various alien technologies he and the others come across, but that doesn't mean he can't have insights or express interest. His dyspraxia also had seemed to be set up to be a larger part of his character, in more ways than it ended up being, seeing as his introduction was explicitly him struggling with it. Dyspraxia doesn't always affect people in all the different parts of their lives, and Ryan doesn't necessarily have to have an arc of any kind concerning his disability, because being disabled is not a character flaw. But, when we are introduced to him through the lens of trying to somehow make the limits he lives with not affect him, in order to make his grandmother Grace proud, and ends the scene so upset he throws his bike off a cliff, I'd... well, I'd hope for some further context. Why is riding a bike so important to him? What's wrong with just not knowing how to ride a bike? One big piece of missed potential for Ryan and Graham both is that Graham really treats Ryan's struggle with dyspraxia terribly in the first episode of series 11 where after Ryan reveals he touched a weird symbol that seems to have started the episode's conflict, Graham accuses him of using his dyspraxia as an excuse for both that and not being able to ride a bike. What have I done? Hard to say, really. I suppose you'll be blaming this on the dyspraxia as well. Can't ride a bike, started an alien invasion. Graham? What? What an asshole! This is, frankly, atrocious behavior that could have been used to explore part of Ryan's reluctance to accept him as family, with potentially an interesting generational struggle around how to treat disabilities, and Graham coming around to be more respectful, understanding, and supportive of his grandson. I also wish we got to dig deeper into how Ryan struggling to accept Graham probably came from his complicated family history. His mother died six years before the events of The Woman Who Fell to Earth, the first episode of series 11, and his father was barely a presence in his life, even missing Grace's funeral, likely causing a deep reluctance to experience further shifting familial dynamics, particularly as it pertains to patriarchs. As a whole, the fam struggled to have their introductions tell us much about who they were, when it comes to how well they fulfilled the purposes of the Companion, they did challenge the Doctor a bit in Series 12, and yes, even more so during Series 13, aka Flux, but that tended to be less about what line she was crossing morally, and more about her lack of communication to them. While this was good to see, the fam tended to be very inconsistent about it, and 13 did many times pursue actions understood in the Moffat and Davies eras to be very disturbing, that should have been called out, but tended to have their severity overlooked, with the fam acting in the sort of assistant capacity that I mentioned earlier. We will wait to talk about 13's morality in the next section, though. Another big piece of missed potential for Ryan and Graham was on their exit. Instead of building on Chibnall's consistent desire to highlight modern political crises, and have Ryan and Graham pursue politics or at least significant activism, both are now simply dealing with aliens locally instead of with the Doctor. This is particularly frustrating seeing as the episode they left the TARDIS in had Jack Trumpel-like Robertson return to popularity after the crisis with the Daleks was over, and Ryan and Graham both had personal experience with how dangerous a man like that is. Yet, despite Chibnall's recurring focus on exploring modern politics or the presence of organizations like UNIT to deal with local alien problems, Graham and Ryan focus their energy on these local aliens. It made me feel even more like the majority of these episodes that tacked modern politics weren't really concerned with how it impacted the characters we were actually following. Take Orphan 55, for example. 
The doctor has a speech about climate change, but does she really say anything that people like Graham, Ryan, and Yaz weren't already aware of? You want me to tell you that Earth's gonna be okay? Cause I can't. In your time, humanity's busy arguing over the washing up while the house burns down. Unless people face facts and change, catastrophe is coming. The future is not fixed. It depends on billions of decisions and actions and people stepping up. Humans. I think you forget how powerful you are. Lives change worlds. People can save planets or wreck them. That's the choice. It certainly doesn't seem like it, and it doesn't really impact them or their actions much going forward either. The fam also struggled to have distinct personalities a lot of the time, with the questions they do ask of the Doctor often coming off as almost interchangeable, rather than rooted in the lived experience and defining traits of each of the companions respectively. Overall, I feel that Yaz should have been the only companion so as to allow for the focus to not be as split between the companions, and really build out that relationship as in a lot of ways it turned out to be the strongest one. And I don't mean because of the romance, after all, romance doesn't necessarily make a bond stronger than a friendship, but because Yaz was always the most emotionally affected by the Doctor's behavior towards her and the others, which really helps her stand out. Thirteen's struggle to sit and think about difficult topics and let herself feel what she's feeling or acknowledge it to those she supposedly trusts, resulting in her constantly talking and needing to do things, is a very interesting main flaw to give the Doctor. It's the epitome of Donna's line, You talk all the time, but you don't say anything. Unfortunately, it's not really given the time it deserves. In Series 12, in the episode Fugitive of the Jadoon, the fam have a moment where they challenge her on this. They say she's been acting off, spending hours looking for something and not even noticing they're sitting right near her, and often leaving to explore and not coming back for ages. However, the problem is that we as the audience haven't been witness to this strange behavior at this point, leaving it up to the fam telling us about her odd behavior in a moment that, to me, feels more jarring than cathartic. Not only are we not shown this strange behavior, we're shown the opposite. As much as I've praised it up to this point, in Can You Hear Me, 13 continues to forget that her companions aren't even with her, and can't stop talking to them as if they are. This unfortunately also highlights how redundant the fam are for 13. She is constantly dumping exposition, whether or not that exposition is actually useful for the audience, or is already apparent and needs no explanation. The fam is also often limited to the most basic of questions, 13 often asking, answering, or both asking and answering the most important ones. This worked for some, but for me it was rather exhausting, as I mentioned earlier. There was a lot of potential in using the Doctor being trapped in the Jadoon prison in Revolution of the Daleks to force her to sit with her complicated feelings in the aftermath of the Timeless Children but she was quickly rescued by Jack and reunited with her companions to fight the Daleks, which not only wasted an opportunity to really force Thirteen to wrestle with her inability to process her complicated feelings, but also undermines the episode's fascinating tagline. How do you fight the Daleks without the Doctor? I guess the answer is that you don't. Again, the idea of Thirteen not wanting to sit and feel those complicated feelings about her identity crisis, or to trust her loved ones with what she's going through, is a good one, but the depiction of those things as her main struggle was rather inconsistent and poorly executed, in my opinion. As I mentioned above, Thirteen also doesn't mind crossing some lines her predecessors would have seen as a moment their darker side overcame them, or when they had to go further than they believe should ever be necessary in order to stop a threat. A good example of this is one I mentioned earlier, when the Doctor tells her companions to set up devices that will cause the Cybermen to be aware of what has happened to them and to feel it. Graham states that it them a bit mad, which is one way of stopping them. But as we saw when the Tenth Doctor did it, it's more like inflicting endless and obscene torture. If Thirteen is using this as her first strategy because of how far the Cybermen have evolved at this point in the universe's timeline, and she's desperate to attack the last humans left, why don't we get to see her wrestle with that? What about how little she's apparently told her human companions about the level of pain it inflicts? 
Some other moments of 13's questionable moral lines are in Arachnids in the UK and Kerblam, respectively. In the former, 13's plan to stop the giant spiders is to lock them in a room and slowly starve them, only for her to get upset when Jack Robertson shoots the mother spider, who had grown so big she was slowly suffocating. The mother spider would have died regardless of whether she was shot or left to die naturally, but only one of those tortures it on the way out. That's what our hero calls a humane death, while the man who represents the worst kind of politician is demonized for what is functionally a mercy killing. Though, admittedly, it does not come from any place of compassion, which the doctor rightfully calls out. It would have been much more compelling if Robertson had been the one advocating for making the spiders suffer on the way out, with the doctor forced to endorse a mercy killing that really tears her up inside. Kerblam, meanwhile, had the Doctor as a massive fan of what was essentially Amazon grown to a cosmic scale, and instead of having her resent how the executives treated their employees as quite literally replaceable thanks to automation, she defended the system completely. While the only character that seemed to care about how the corporation was treating human beings turned out to have been using the automated system to deliver bombs to the customers and destroy trust in automation through mass murder. Making the person afraid of losing his jobs to machines the villain seems darkly ironic now, considering how much movie and film executives have been hoping to be able to replace the role of writers like Chibnall with a robot lately. Shots fired! This could have been a fascinating deconstruction of how massive corporations take advantage of their workers and don't even really think about these workers as people, which can drive people to desperate measures. It's unfortunate. Every extremist character spouting vaguely leftist rhetoric, if we must still have them, could be used as a way to depict what is often inevitable when people become desperate and see no other way to change things. The Doctor is about preserving life, and she would never condone mass murder in the service of change. But that doesn't mean she wouldn't make absolutely sure to destabilize the structure that created someone who thought that was the only option. The Doctor wrestling with morality is a long-standing pillar of Doctor Who, and Jodie Whittaker doesn't get a chance to explore that part of the Doctor in the way that, frankly, she deserved to. We may as well start with the most controversial part of the 13th Doctor's overarching story the Timeless Child. The idea that the ability to regenerate was taken from another species and made to be something the Time Lords could control does fall right in line with what we know about them, and how arrogant and corrupt we know them to be, as while it's likely only a very small number of Time Lords have ever known the actual origins of regeneration, the behavior that we've seen the elite of Gallifrey adopt match perfectly with a society that built its perceived greatness on the back of an exploited child. Though, the major issue most seem to have is not the existence of the Timeless Child, but that it is the Doctor themselves that is the Timeless Child. Many have said it ruins the character by making them capital S special instead of someone who just decided to do good absent of any wider universal importance a normal person who just likes to help. At least by Gallifreyan standards. Well, I agree that this does make the Doctor more special, perhaps to an unnecessary degree, I do think it's worth remembering a few things. First, the Doctor has now canonically been many other races and genders other than the 13 white men that they were before Jodie Whittaker, which is genuinely a good development. This is what allowed us to get Joe Martin's incredible take on the Doctor, though we will certainly talk more about her wasted potential later. Second, the Doctor doesn't remember any of these other lives outside of the regeneration cycle we're familiar with. None of their choices, from Hartnell to Capaldi, were influenced by being the Timeless Child, not to mention is through the filtered memories as shown in the episode Ascension of the Cybermen, the Doctor has always wanted to make a difference. That's why they joined a division. Why do you want to be a guard, Brendan? He wants to serve. Best leave the lad speak for himself, eh, yeah, Pat? Right. I want to make a difference. Though clearly, at some point, they realized that division was not exactly noble in their intentions, which is presented as why they defected and became a fugitive. 
everything that makes the Doctor who they are, as wonderfully crystallized by the Twelfth Doctor in The Doctor Falls, remains intact. If I run away today, good people will die. If I stand and fight, some of them might live. Maybe not many, maybe not for long. Hey, you know, maybe there's no point in any of this at all, but it's the best I can do. So I'm going to do it, and I will stand here doing it till it kills me. You're going to die too. Someday. What would that be if you thought about it? What would you die for? Who I am. It's where I stand, where I stand. It's where I fall. The Doctor's origin, their biology, they have nothing to do with everything that makes the Doctor who they are. In fact, that's part of the point of the Timeless Child story. Though admittedly uprooting so much, creating such a divisive retcon just to tell the story of it not ultimately mattering, feels very cheap and frustrating. We'll get to that. Regardless, this had so much potential. Even understanding that the Timeless Child was never going to be anyone other than the Doctor, because that story was inspired by Chibnall's own history as an adopted child, and he wished to tell a story about the struggle to reconcile who you believe yourself to be with where you come from, it didn't necessarily have to feel quite so... perhaps shallow is the word I'm looking for? Much has already been criticized about how the Master basically gives Thirteen a PowerPoint presentation, but what I'm really talking about is that identity crisis storylines can be extremely compelling, but they aren't super easy to pull off. Especially if the point of the Identity Crisis arc is that the character learns that they are ultimately not defined by whatever caused them that crisis. That self-acceptance can be done in a really powerful way, or it can be done in a way that makes the Identity Crisis we've witnessed the character go through feel rather pointless. To me, the 13th Doctor falls into the latter, especially because she learns that self-acceptance in the Series 12 finale, and then appears to have left it behind by the time Flux rolls around. The story behind an identity crisis can still have an impact beyond the point where self-acceptance has been achieved, which is what the Division arc in Flux almost was. I think Flux needed to be much more focused on Tech Taeyun, as even if the Doctor found herself strengthened by the knowledge that there's so many more of her out there, it's still natural to want to speak to the closest thing she has to a mother, especially considering how much gross experimentation that mother did on the child she adopted. If instead of Swarm and Azur killing Tech Taeyun, it was the other way around, we could have seen the tremendous power Division had been built up to have by easily taking out these villains who had caused so much damage. Meanwhile, in the episodes building up to that, rather than returning to the identity crisis story that was resolved in The Timeless Children, I believe we should have spent time really getting to know how the Doctor feels about this mother figure she never knew, and how she feels about how that mother figure treated and used her. We get some really interesting conflict between them as Thirteen demands answers, which the potential of is unfortunately wiped away when Swarm and Azur kill Tech Taeyun. While not necessary per se, it also would have been interesting to bring back the actress who played the character RTT has confirmed was meant to be the Doctor's mother in the end of Time Part 1 and 2 to play Tech Taeyun, creating a payoff for longtime fans of the show and a much more meaningful moment when the creator of the Flux speaks her name. Many fans, though not all of them, already have an emotional investment in the woman who had reached out to Wilf and seemed to be expressing concern about the Tenth Doctor's looming death at the time. They call it the legend of the blue box. Oh, I've never been in here before. I'm not one for churches. Too cold. This was the site of a convent back in the 1300s. It said a demon fell from the sky. Then a man appeared, a man in a blue box. They called him the sainted physician. He smote the demon and then disappeared. It was a bit of a coincidence. It said there's no such thing as coincidence. <laughs> Tech Taeyun would become a figure who seems to care for the Doctor, but is also very much their abuser, making her a much more complex character. Compare this to the time we get between Thirteen and the Master. While there were plenty of other villains the Thirteenth Doctor faced, her fights against the Master by far outweighed the rest. 
I adore this version of the Master, and we get to see so much dialogue between him and Thirteen where they challenge each other. The amount of scenes we get with them together tells us so much about them, in a way that Tek Tayun doesn't even get a chance to have, despite being a much more unknown figure to the majority of Doctor Who's audience than the Master. That said, like with so much else in this era, there was more that could have been done with the Master. This Master, and the Master the 10th and 12th Doctors faced, have a lot in common. Both share an almost campy glee in pursuing their plans and a particularly simmering, rageful hatred toward the Doctor. That said, the Master that fights Thirteen also has a fascinating layer of deep, intense self-loathing, and is broken in a way we've never really seen the Master be. That brokenness to me makes the most sense as the starting point for an incarnation of the Master to try and rekindle their friendship with the Doctor. I don't think that desire Missy had could have come from anywhere but an incarnation who had reached their absolute lowest point. Why are you doing this? I need you to know we're not so different. I need my friend back. Every battle, every war, every invasion. From now on, you decide the outcome. What's the matter, Mr. President? Don't you trust yourself? But while I personally don't think that needed confirming, and I honestly do think the Master is one of the strongest parts of Chibnall's tenure as a showrunner, that self-loathing and how it informs the actions he takes is something I would have loved to see explored a bit more than it was. It would have been really interesting if his plans had been more potentially self-destructive, or at least mutually destructive, than previous Masters, for example. It's also not super necessary, but it would have been cool if the Master merging with the Siberium had been confirmed as the hybrid that was made to be such a foreboding threat in Series 9 after that story failed to land for many fans. It wouldn't have mattered to most people, but it would have been satisfying to me at least to have that story closed and to feel like Chibnall was paying attention to what came before him and realized his own ideas could mesh with that. The hybrid is, after all, supposedly meant to be a creature. creature thought to be crossbred from two warrior races. Or... Matrix prophecies concur that this creature will one day stand in the ruins of Gallifrey. Mwah! Perfect fit. This master also could have been a master that Joe Martin's doctor had also faced. Seeing as both are time travelers, that's well within possibility. This would also have given him an upper hand in knowledge about the doctor's history beyond just an exposition dump on Gallifrey. The master's destruction of Gallifrey also had some interesting potential with perhaps even just a tease of something like Gallifreyan refugees that had managed to escape, creating something fresh for the future, rather than just returning Gallifrey back to the same situation it was in before the 50th anniversary. Similarly, it was a bit frustrating that half the universe was wiped out by the Flux, and it wasn't even mentioned for the rest of the era, only having its consequences touched on during the recent run of 60th anniversary specials with David Tennant. As has probably become apparent, Chibnall was rather inconsistent with making weighty developments in the story feel lasting and meaningful. Considering the Doctor literally meets time itself at the end of Series 13, it would have been interesting to see her have to bargain for the damage of the Flux to be reversed. Maybe she has to trade the Fob Watch with all the memories of her forgotten lives in it, trading all those past lives of hers in return for saving the ones of others that had been lost. Side note, much, much smaller bit of Miss Potential, but my goodness does Jodie look better with the dark coat that she wears as Time and the light grey one she wears as the 13th Doctor. Going back to Joe Martin's Doctor as our main final point, I feel she was woefully misused. As the second ever female Doctor and the first Doctor of Color, it was honestly borderline disgusting to demote her further each time we see her from Deuteragonist to a borderline magical negro trope-esque cameo, to showing up for a single conversation in a mirror, and finally to a hologram for a quick distraction that felt like it lasted less than a minute. Of course, we can't really talk about Joe Martin's Doctor without talking about Division, a Time Lord Black Ops organization that breaks the Time Lord code and influences and intervenes in the history and events of other peoples and planets. As I mentioned before, this had a ton of potential, and the idea of the Doctor joining something they oppose the methods of in a desire to make a difference is a concept rich with promise. Questionable decision to make the first Black Doctor a perpetual fugitive aside, hence why I haven't referred to her as the fugitive Doctor prior to this moment, despite it being her official moniker, a la the War Doctor, there's no doubt in my mind that Joe Martin could blow us away with a complex and troubled Doctor trapped in a corrupt system that will never let her go 
yet never lets her be who she is. Unfortunately, we know very little about Division, so it's hard to suggest anything tangible outside of that. I really enjoyed The Power of the Doctor, but at least one of the final three specials ought to have been a multi-doctor special with Joe Martin as a full-fledged co-star alongside Jodie Whittaker. Ideally, the final three specials should have been a trilogy wrapping up the loose threads of Chibnall's era, with Joe Martin and Jodie Whittaker sharing the screen. Hey, Mr. Davies? Maybe make one of those many spin-offs you're planning about Joe Martin's doctor? Please? She really deserves it. In general, I feel that truly bad ideas are extremely rare, because great execution can make something that initially may turn some away into something amazing. The same goes vice versa, of course. Great ideas with bad execution are sometimes even more frustrating than a so-called bad idea with poor execution. I don't personally feel like any of the stories Chibnall wanted to tell were unsalvageable with proper execution, but it's clear that for a lot of people, though importantly, not all, that execution left something to be desired, to put it nicely. I love Jody in the role, and I think Tribnal was able to tell some incredibly strong stories with monsters that have lost their accompanying hype in recent years like the Weeping Angels, the Santarans, and even the Daleks. And there's nothing inherently wrong about digging into the past and reframing everything we thought we knew. It's just that, to me at least, Chris rarely seemed to understand the level of potential he had in his hands. I'm not going to make any sweeping claims about him as a person. I'm not even going to call him a bad writer. And if nothing else, I respect that he refused to compromise the story he believed in because people were being jerks on Twitter slash X slash whatever stupid thing it's called now. But I think with something as special as Doctor Who, not taking advantage of the potential of the world and characters and concepts, especially those that you introduce yourself, it stings a little more than it might otherwise. I really want future writers to see the potential I see, and to go back and make some of this a bit more meaningful than it was on the first go. RTD already showed us what could be done with just the threads left by the Flux storyline. What else are we missing out on? With the Hooniverse now an official branding, and so many spin-offs apparently on the way, there's no reason to forget about what could have been and try to make it more than it was. And fellow Whovians, let's try to take after the Doctor and be a little kinder to the cast and crew of the past, present, and future of this show we love. We kind of shit the bed on that for Moffat and Chibnall both, and it's time to try and make things right. Thank you so much to everyone who has made it this far. Huge thanks to my friend and editor Remnant Bardock. Couldn't do this without you. Thanks to everyone in my incredible Discord community, Adam Plays a Host, who have all supported me as I wrote this and helped me fine tune it. Link in the description, along with my other socials and Bardocks. And remember, I now have a Patreon! The more people are able to contribute, the more likely I'll be able not only to have a more sustainable payment source for Remnant Bardock and keep on top of cool new games for Twitch, but also to sustainably fund cool projects like an audio drama I have in the works. More details at a much later time for that, but I think it's going to be awesome, so if you can help me pay everyone fairly, that would be so appreciated. Right now, the only available tier is $3 a month for which you'll get shoutouts at the end of my videos, access to older works of mine not listed on my channel, voting on polls and making suggestions for upcoming essays, and access to the Queers and Deers role in my Discord community, which allows you to engage with and even potentially contribute to all my current works in progress, including my video essays, my Twitch streams, and my work at the DC Creators Network. With luck, I'm hoping to put out one video essay like this a month. So if you want to see the next one, make sure to subscribe to catch it when it comes out. Other than that, leave a like if you liked the video, Dislike it if you didn't, give your thoughts in the comments, give me feedback, or hell, just comment some gibberish for the algorithm, and I'll see you all soon.